we're a numerous group tonight. Uh, let me welcome everyone to this uh, discussion with Nicholas Royal uh, about his uh, most recent book, David Bowie and it Blyton and the Sun Machine. This is, I, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm beginning to lose count. I think we're up to six discussions now, book discussions. These have been um, actually quite delightful occasions. They're really meant as um, actually friendly, friendly convocations uh, in, in this thing I like to think of as an intellectual society, European Graduate School, which doesn't have enough money to bring everybody together all the time. Nevertheless, um, is, uh, uh, is is meant to be uh, uh, part of a society. Oh. And hello to that voice as well. <laughs> um, Nick has uh, um, participated with us in one of these discussions with Michael uh, Noss uh, regarding his book on DeLillo. Otherwise, we haven't had a chance to to, to host him, and I, I very much regret that because I think he's one of the most sensitive and intelligent readers of literature publishing today. He's been a, a, just an extremely important voice for many years. Uh, he's written quite quite a range of books in addition to his work with the Oxford Literary Review. Excuse me. And let me just mention a couple of these. Um, there's an English guide to bird watching. Um, which is 2017, and this is in the, uh, I, I gotta say, in a, in a genre which I think he's hesitant to define, but nevertheless, I'll say it's verging on the creative or veering to, to the creative. Um, an introduction to literature, he's into the fifth edition with Andrew Bennett, um, the thing called literature, uh, a veering, excuse me, a theory of literature, 2011, Quilt, a novel, um, a book in memory of Jacques Derrida, and from 2009, uh, How to Read Shakespeare, 2005, Jacques Derrida, 2003, The Uncanny, 2003, Deconstructions, A User's Guide, 2000, where he was an editor, E.M. Forster, 1999, After Derrida, 1995, then Elizabeth Bowen and the Dissolution of the Novel, Still Lives, 1995, and finally, I think a particularly important book, uh, which is making reappearances in what we'll discuss today, telepathy in literature, essays on the reading mind. So uh, I'm just racing through that. I mean, these, each of these are uh, deserving of uh, significant commentary, but I just want to call your attention to this and uh, also let you know that there is a brief bio on the um, EGS website, which you can consult. We have um, a, a, a really nice group joining us tonight. Um, of course, along, along with, um, along with Nemanja, who is, uh, as always, our technical um, director, and also, I have to say, the, the innovator for this series, and I, I want to recognize that. Um, I think that his, his role has been particularly important in um, trying to bring forward a literary dimension in the work of our faculty. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm most grateful to him for that, and always for his, his, his backup. Uh, Lars Iyer is with us. Um, Lars has been working with us in the area of creative writing, but also academic writing. He was with us this summer in Sasfe. We have Michael Nass back, del delighted to, to have him. Uh, um, we have Nicholas, of course, and uh, Alyssa Martyr. Alyssa Martyr, um, who has taught with us at the EGS um, and is currently in, uh, at Emory University in Atlanta, where she's a professor of French and comparative literature. Um, I don't think I've forgotten anyone. We have, but we have we have a bit of a um, a group tonight. So I'm going to move quickly. Uh, Elizabeth is uh, uh, excuse me. Alyssa is going to um, read a, um, a um, an, an introduction to the work that she has um, very graciously um, composed for us. Um, then Nick will read a um, a few pages from the book before we turn to the um, the responses uh, and the discussion. Uh, Michael will start off, then uh, Lars will follow, Alyssa will follow Lars, and then Nemanja will, will follow up with um, questions of his own. Again, this is meant to be a, a, a discussion, a friendly encounter. Uh, it's not so much a critical encounter, but uh, I would say one in which we share, celebrate, and work towards some understanding together. So with that, let me just, I'm, I'm going to sit back a bit and, and function as host this time. Um, I, I, that may be a relief. <laughs> so, 
Um, with that, let me welcome very warmly uh, everyone who is participating, everyone who is joining us. And um, yes, I, I, I wish us all a, a very warm discussion. So with that, Nick, would you, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm having trouble with the order tonight. Elissa, you're first and then Nick. Thanks so much, Chris. It's great to be back here. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Great. Um, I didn't want to uh, write something, but then I did because Nick's book has so many moving parts that I couldn't describe it. So I had to try to describe it in writing. So here goes. David Bowie, Enid Blyton and the Sun Machine is an extraordinary, extravagant book. And although the book escapes generic definition in the prologue, Nick offers up the playful term memoirish to describe it. He invites us to hear how the word Irish is silently embedded within memoirish. Without giving everything away, I can say that the Irish intonations of the ghost of Nick's grandmother, the illustrator Lola Onslow, reverberate as one of the rhythmic bass lines of this meditation of music, love, the now, and the queer erotic kinship that comes from childhood. The book speaks to, for, and from the eternal child within us. The sun machine of the title comes from David Bowie's song, Memory of a Free Festival. It is many things and no one thing. It is event, promise, and disclosure of worlds hitherto unseen, unthought, unknown. The sun machine exposes extrasensorial communications with the childhood realm that Nick calls the undermined after Enid Enid Blyton. In the preface, Nick briefly relates how the book came to be. The idea of putting David Bowie, Enid Blyton, and the Sun Machine together came, he says, like an eruption out of nowhere. The book took shape in the uncanny quotidian Geistzeit nowhere time of COVID. He was reading Enid, Enid Blyton to his young sons during the day and listening to David Bowie at night. Meanwhile, he was also trying to decide whether or how to accept the offer of VS or voluntary severance from the university. He began to imagine another kind of VS, a series of lectures, valedictory seminars that might offer an alternative to the institutionalization of the education system by asking what a university is actually for. The result is an exhilarating exercise in extracurricular education. The book is written in several different voices and is divided into four parts. Part one, called the M Times, and M stands for metamorphosis, narrates the daily life of a family of characters that include Daddy, Mummy, two boys, Zeph eight, and Monty five, and features the participation of Daddy's menagerie of accented, opinionated hand puppets and other such animated creatures. Part two is a series of eight ostensibly video recorded asynchronous lectures delivered posthumously by a, quote, departed ghost academic that are gathered under the title, A Sense of the Ending. The eight lectures are punctuated by musical interludes, poetry, and silences. They are iterative and interruptive. The borders of these virtual lectures are temporally and sensuously porous. They are supplemented by a musical playlist, birdsong, and a picture break. The lectures turn into a memoirish thriller, part adventure story and part psychic treasure hunt that, in giving voice to Nick's beloved ghosts, uncovers vast realms of feeling that emerge from the undermine. Fragments from the past unearth entire worlds of being and feeling felt by people no longer here that move us with the force of a sun machine coming down. And during this descent into the recesses of the undermine, Nick recovers a memory fragment of his mother telling him that his paternal grandmother, Lola Onslow, had an affair with, Le with Enid, Enid Blyton. In a memoirish coda to part two filled with love and laughter, Nick conjures up the affair between Enid and Lola. We also briefly catch the sound of Nick's grandmother, Lola Onslow, laughing along with her husband, Tony Guggeroyle. In part three, typewriter, we return to the family from part one. But time has passed. Daddy has left the university. Monty has started writing his own version of Enid Blyton's famous five books. Daddy rediscovers his old typewriter and begins writing a book, perhaps the one we are reading. 
part four, Strangers Meet We Win, takes us into the intimate world of Lola Onslow as she meets Enid Blyton and they fall in love. This part contains fragments of Lola's diary, passages from a book written by Lola's mother, Irma Blood, faces and how to read them, and ends with the two women laughing as their affair ignites with a slow burn. The last word of the book is exploding. Love is the sun machine exploding. So that's all. Thank, thank you very much, Elissa. I couldn't have done that. Um, it's uh, extremely uh, helpful to, to have that uh, overview and it's far more eloquent and uh, succinct than I could possibly uh, manage myself. So thank you very much. What I thought I would do is read uh, a little extract, like three pages from one of these lectures, these ghost lectures uh, that Elissa was just referring to. They're lectures that were never given except um, as a, a, a speculation, a hypothesis of the lectures that uh, the narrator would like to give if the university had invited him to say something uh, at the point of departure from the university. So it was indeed in intended I think, first of all, as a speech about as long as Elissa's, um, but it developed into eight lectures. And uh, I thought I would read from uh, the lecture, which is which is called the Croydon Bookshop. Uh, and this is uh, the fifth lecture. So you, you have to imagine, if you will, that you can't see me and in a sense, the most appropriate thing for me to do here would be to turn my camera off. Um, shall I do that? I'll, I'll do that. OK, so I've never read this aloud before. And I'm going to read uh, from the fifth lecture, which is about silence uh, in part, and uh, it picks up, it, it starts off with wanting to talk about a dream. So those of you who may have, have read the book will be aware that it uh, it does veer about and uh, dreaming is where this particular lecture picks up. Um, so I'll come back in, in about four or five minutes. Um, in his marvelous poem, Frost at Midnight, Samuel Taylor Coleridge evokes the night with the words sea and hill and wood with all the numberless goings on of life inaudible as dreams. Today's lecture comes to you out of the silence of this dream. I appreciate that recounting a dream can be self-indulgent and ridiculous. It can be as boring as listening to someone regaling you with their thoughts when they're really drunk or stoned. I hope you'll forgive me and see its curious relevance and interest here. I woke up in bed at home in Sussex by the sea in the middle of having dinner with Gerald Doherty and Randall Stevenson in Helsinki. The fact that one can be asleep in Seaford where I live but then in the sloppy mess of waking up, be in the capital city of Finland, is a readily recognisable idea. It's about the liminal or transitional space of the hypnagogic, where you are neither properly asleep nor properly awake. This out of place feeling relates to a phenomenon that I propose to call the Croydon effect. This lecture itself, for reasons that I hope will become clear, is called the Croydon Bookshop. My friend Gerald Doherty has been dead for several years, so it makes no sense that I'd be having dinner with him, but that's dreams for you. Randall Stevenson, on the other hand, I met only once about 25 years ago in Edinburgh. 
Recently, however, I acquired his book, Reading the Times. That's not a book about reading a newspaper. It's about temporality and history in 20th century fiction, as the subtitle runs. And I'd been dipping into it. Reading the Times is, to borrow a phrase from Enid Blyton, a very dippable into book. Dipping is, of course, a form of swimming. Children in Blyton's books are forever doing it, but also flying as a bird might dip into a bush. And of course, it's about chance, as in a lucky dip. I don't know about you, but I like to take several dips a day. Sometimes I can't stop. A five minute dip in reading the times will turn up something intriguing, I promise you. Yesterday evening for me, it was Stevenson's discussion of Henri Bergson. In an essay called Dreams from 1901, Bergson describes how memories experienced in the present carry underneath them thousands on thousands of others. Our past life is there, writes Bergson, preserved even to the minutest details. Nothing is forgotten. All we have perceived, thought, willed from the first awakening of consciousness persists indefinitely. Gerald Doherty was deeply interested in meditation and Eastern philosophy. He wrote a lot about D.H. Lawrence and James Joyce, especially in relation to desire. There's Oriental Lawrence, The Quest for the Secrets of Sex, for example, and a book about Joyce's Dubliners called The Games Narrators Play. I recommend dipping into all and any of his books. I would not have thought of Gerald as a time machine thinker, it took a dream to make me realise. Desire is always time sensitive. All games are games with time. Gerald and I never met in Helsinki. He lived in the Finnish countryside, somewhere in the region of Turku. I used to go and stay with him and his stardust spangled larger than life wife, Pam, and their imperiously large cats in a marvellously peaceful house in what felt like the middle of a bucolic nowhere. It was, in fact, on an island surrounded by forest and sea with the more or less unpronounceable name Rilmatila. Why dine together in Helsinki? Dine, as I've already noted, is an anagram of Enid. The dream work is always doing overtime. As Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty might say, these dream workers should be paid extra. Together also requires clarification. Initially, I was at a different table with another friend, Liz Walker, a colleague at the university, a member of what is nowadays called professional services, implying that there might also be a distinct group of employees who provide unprofessional services. But let's leave that aside for now. Liz took voluntary severance last year. Like many other colleagues, I miss her. Anyway, Liz and I, were having a very enjoyable chat while eating some exquisite cake that she had insisted we have and then I saw Gerald a few tables away. I caught his eye or he caught mine and I knew we had to speak. I had to say goodbye. Dreams in which dead loved ones come back to life have something of the beauty of the songs one loves. In the love of music memory is shared Love is preserved and ready at any second to return. It's there in the word record. Songs are forms of resurrection. David Bowie understood this, perhaps better than anyone. Where are we now? How does one say goodbye to someone who is already dead? In the dream, I was vaguely aware of that aporia. I loved Gerald Doherty and never wanted to say goodbye to him. I suppose that is the simplicity of Catullus when he ends his elegy to his dead brother, atque in perpetuum frater ave atque vale. How should we translate this line? And forever, brother, hail and farewell. And so for always, in perpetuity, brother, hail and farewell. You can never stop wanting to greet once more the one to whom you are saying goodbye. 
That is the subject of the catchy but rather banal 1967 Beatles song, Hello Goodbye, the Hello as Goodbye. More poignant and anguished, Bowie's music seems haunted by the hail and farewell. This is Major Tom to ground control. The hello comes with a bye-bye love. Everyone says hi means everyone says bye. Say goodbye is say hello. Bowie seems deeply interested in the power of music as greeting or valediction, and especially both at the same time. It's not just the explicit instances of hello space boy, everyone says hi, or love is lost. There's a sort of persistent loving, dissolving hail and farewell that recurs throughout his catalogue. But back to the dream. Draped over the shoulders and tables of other diners, strung out between the table where I was sitting with Liz and the table where Gerald was sitting with Randall, was an inordinately long measuring tape. You know the metal sort that if you retract it too quickly can cut like a whip. It belonged, I realised, to Randall. And because I was aware of the inconvenience and annoyance it was causing to other diners, while he himself was apparently oblivious, I made it my priority on parting from Liz and making my way across to their table to tell him about the awkwardness of his tape measure. It was a beautiful summer evening, that sort of ethereal white night one gets in Finnish summer, and the tables were all outside. My most urgent wish, however, was to talk to my dead friend, Gerald. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there and come back. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, very, I, I'm listening to that. Um, having read it in the past few days, it's. Uh, I'm just reminded how much we need to go back and back uh, to 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 these to these beautiful pages. Um, they're so rich. But with that, um, just a little note. Let me pass now to Michael, uh, um, who can begin our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Nick Royal says in the introduction to his new book that this work, and Alyssa already recalled this, came out of nowhere, that its arrival was a complete surprise to him, and that he hopes it retains for the reader the, quote, traces of its mysterious eruption. Well, I'm very happy to be able to testify this evening to the unexpected, mysterious, and I have to say truly miraculous nature of this new book. It is as mysterious as absorbing and entrancing as anything that Nick has previously written. And that is saying a lot. Though we have all come to expect a great deal from the pen or the computer or the manual typewriter of Nick Royal, there is never anything mechanical or predictable about his writing, even if there are always returns to themes and motifs treated in other works. Just as every day is a genuinely new day, every Nick Royal work and perhaps especially this one, is a new work. The sun also rises in this work as in others, but it does so in a totally new way. In this case, the work that has arisen is about many different things, Bowie and Blyton, to be sure, but also the university, literature, the pandemic, retirement, family, and sun machines, to name just a few. At the same time, as it is also about its own surprising, an improbable emergence or eruption. As Peter Boxall so aptly puts it in his prep, in his postface to this work, this is a book not just about sun machines, but a book that is itself a sun machine. It thus is or does or performs what it talks about, like Kafka's The Burrow, says Peter, among other narratives. It is a book that is itself a sun machine, and if my reading experience is mirrored by that of others, it is a book that mysteriously provokes in the reader in a totally delightful, but also uncanny way, a proliferation of memories, associations, narratives, and experiences of one's own. It is thus a book that as Sun Machine will nourish and grow and, and cause to grow and flourish other Sun Machines, other suns and other stars and other space oddities. For me, it has occasioned a flood of memories and, and associations about my own experiences teaching, 
uh, memories of the pandemic, family, music, literature, and so on. And it has given rise not so much to questions, I don't know how to pose questions to a work like this, but to a series of remarks or comments that I would simply like to run by Nick just to hear what he has to say. So I wanna ask him first about the unexpected way in which this book emerged for him. I wanna ask about what part, what element in this rather heterogeneous and seemingly incongruous, incongruous series of figures Bowie, Blight, and so on, emerged first. What was it that first looked like the rosy-fingered dawn of a new work? I also want to ask about this book as a part of English literature, as an English book. And so I would like to ask Nick to reflect a bit upon England in relationship to America, Bowie's America and his own. And I also want to ask him about the university and the VS, that is the voluntary severance that he contracted there, and if we had time, I would have loved, though I don't think there will be time, I would have loved to veer very briefly into the realm of the uncanny so that I could ask him about Bowie, Blyton, memory, automation, and artificial friends like Clara in Clara and the Sun, but also about Westworld and thus about Julian James and the origins of consciousness and the breakdown of the, of the bicameral mind. And if we really had enough time, I would wanna ask him about Jeremy Irons. Just two questions then, among all of these. As for the writing of this book, I said that Nick said that it came for him out of nowhere. So I'm curious whether all the elements came or came together at once, if that is even possible, out of nowhere, or whether there wasn't some initial trigger, maybe like Proust's Madeleine or Venteuil's Petite Phrase, that then underwent a process of layering to use David Bowie's word to describe the creation of his music, a layering of themes or motifs upon one another, the pandemic, the voluntary uh, severance at the university, Bowie, the daily reading of Enid Blyton to the kids during the pandemic, Nick's grandmother and her perhaps secret relationship to Blyton, the sun, but then also the layering effects of different arts, music, and not only Bowie, but Chopin, uh, Bach and Beethoven, as well as Charles Mingus, literature, and not just Blyton, but Sixou, Elizabeth Bowen, H.G. Wells, Shakespeare, Ishiguro, Walter Pater, uh, Wallace Stevens, the Rubaiyat, painting and illustration, Stephen Finer, but also Nick's own paternal grandmother, Lola Onslaught. And then there came the, gener the layering on of generations. First, the narrator, Nick, and his partner and their children, but then also the narrator's parents, and then slowly the narrator's paternal grandmother, who arrives somewhat mysteriously on the scene, and who, along with the children, Monty and Zeph, seem to have been given the last word. If this book came out of nowhere, is there a part that came out of nowhere first? The out of nowhere that led to all the other out of nowheres. So that would be my, my first question. Uh, Nick, and I'm going to then skip to just a second question and then let you respond. Now, I said I could not resist a question about America. First about Bowie in America, about young Americans, about writing songs on the train from Seattle to Phoenix, Seattle being not just any city in Nick's life, about the Beckenham Free Festival that took place the same weekend as Woodstock, and so was perhaps already then, I don't know if this was the case, but I wonder, was it already then, as it surely can be read today, as a kind of counter Woodstock? Since David Bowie, even back in 1969, was, it seems to me, anything but a hippie. And then I want to ask Nick about, uh, 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 Nick about America as well. Nick in America, where some of this book was written. Nick in America as opposed to England. Nick as an English academic. Nick reading Enid Blyton to his two sons during the pandemic. Nick, or at least the narrator, whose partner is an American, who, like I, I must confess, had never heard of Enid Blyton before Nick's book, despite the fact that Blyton has published a colossal 600 million copies worldwide. So I, I'm not sure that there's a question here, but I just wanted to ask you, if possible, to reflect upon the Britishness and or Americanness of this work. And let me leave it to you, Nick, and I could come back to other questions later if we have time.
Thank, thank you so much, Michael, for that um, great uh, pastor of, of extremely interesting and um, obviously difficult questions. Um, but uh, yeah, if I, if I just okay, quite quite um, try try to be fairly succinct. I, I I hope it wouldn't be too frustrating of me to say that the the origin of this book is the next book. So if you can wait for a, a year or two, okay. uh, I'm hoping to write where this one came from, in a sense. Um, but that's probably not a satisfactory response. And I uh, love it as a response. <laughs> I mean, if if you were asking me, you know, how did it start coming together? I I only, you know, Elissa has a, a wonderful book called Dead Time, which I'm I'm sure you know and others know. And um in in many ways, the pandemic, especially the the lockdown was a kind of experience of dead time for me mm -hmm. and and then it wasn't at all it was incredibly full of life in a in a way that um i found joyous and utterly surprising and part of that came from the sort of proximity with which i was spending my life my time with my young children and and Mm -hmm. my wife um uh, and partly it was the reading and the listening to music and the intensity of those juxtapositions i suppose um so i, I there wasn't a madeline moment as such mm -hmm. um there was some there was some occasion on which i mean i i I'll just hold up the back of the book just for people to see this. But, you know, in, in the um, right at the back of the book, there's a, a photograph of what's called the Bowie Bandstand in um, Croydon Road Recreation Ground in Beckenham. And um, I had I never went to Beckenham until March this year. I went there with Matthew Frost, my editor and um the 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 bandstand itself was a, an extraordinary you know it's it, it's a grade two listed building so for england it's it's a very precious thing but it's completely uncared for uh it's falling to bits and there's nobody there you know it, it was a it was a very sort of lugubrious in some ways but but also um i don't know i found i found it a, a very inspiring uh, moment to stand in the bandstand and and see this is where memory of a free festival came from mm -hmm. this is where he sat when he when when life on mars came to him you know this this extraordinary little bandstand um was for me a, a kind of uh, a bit like a car some kind of mad imaginary carousel for for me to sort of start thinking about how beckenham uh, figured in the life of Bowie, but obviously also in the life of Enid Blyton, who spent the first nineteen mm -hmm. years of her life in Beckenham. Um, so that that's a, a to respond to the first question. The question about um, Bowie in America and me as a, a British uh, uh, academic uh, writer or, or whatever, I I don't know. I think. Um, yeah, definitely. If I were interested in writing books that would sell lots of copies, I wouldn't write a, a book about Enid Blyton because, um, you know, in the US, nobody's heard of Enid Blyton. Absolutely true. I, I think Elissa has, but, you know, the, the, there may be, you know, very few people have heard of Enid Blyton. And it's an incredible kind of non-phenomenon in a way that, that she had no readership in the US, whereas everywhere, practically everywhere else in the world, people to this day read Enid Blyton. So that that in itself is kind of fascinating. But um, 
it does mean that if you're trying to sell some books in the States, it's it's not a good subject, probably. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the thing about Bowie in America that, that interests me, and I've been writing about this um, just more recently for uh, an, an essay about another piece on Bowie. You know, he, unlike other musicians, British musicians in the late 60s and early 70s, he didn't Americanize. Mm -hmm. He kind of retained this Britishness. And um, I find that really fascinating. And, and, and I think that was sort of part of what led me to think about the ways in which, you know, or, you know in, in our sort of, in many ways, very dark uh, moment, uh, post-Brexit, perhaps post-pandemic, post-whatever, um, and all the rest of it. Being English is not something that one feels particularly happy about. You know, it's not a, it's not, it's, um, it's awful. You know, England's awful. It's just awful in so many ways. And um, I think I was struggling in some ways to, to think about, you know, some sort of affirmative way of uh, thinking Englishness. And this for me was, was something that Bowie and Blyton together conspired to, to present, you know, that, that quite unexpectedly I could see how you know, an interest in the fantastical and the surreal and the the queer and in irony, in humour, in mimicry, in disguise, in storytelling um, and in laughter, in comedy itself. Um, these were some of the things that for me sort of brought Bowie and Blyton together and enabled me to see a, a possible different fresh perspective on what might be worthwhile about English you know either being English or, or also in a sense the the English language um, so yeah that, that 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 would be my um quick response on that yeah no thank you that's great and I, I will leave it there and if there is time I'll come back perhaps to some of the other questions thank fantastic you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and Nick, for a beautiful answer. Lars, would you like to follow up? Thank you. Yes, my question, my questions were a bit more, a bit shorter and more rapid fire. So a, a, a transition of, of style here. You had us listen to this wonderful song by David Bowie, this long song from, from, from the album, which is now called um, Space Oddity. And this song is Memory of a Free Festival, which is the occasion of a lot of reflections that you have in your... Um, in your in your work of reality literature, I think as as you call it, I think at some point. Now, memory of a, of a free festival, as you say, is a song about music as coming as event. And what's interesting about this song, one of the many things interesting about this song, it, it recalls a moment, recalls something that's happened, and yet this thing that has happened, at the same time, hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. It's going to come. It's coming. So it's a song about music as coming as event. There was a sun machine. Did the sun machine come at some stage? Well, it's going to come again if it came once. There is a sun machine and it's coming down. And you compare this event to the planetary collision at the end of the uh, uh, film by Lars von Trier, uh, Melancholia. He says, without the, 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 you know, without that sort of sadness. But Bowie's song, you say, gives us a, a different sense of the ending. Something big is ending, but something new is coming. And here we have a, you know, a sense of a, a word which doesn't, I don't think, appear in the, in, the, in, the, in the reality literature that you've written, which is that word apocalypse. Something at an end, something comes to an end, yet yeah, that coming to the end is the very condition of a rebirth. Only when the old world goes will a new world come. And just to continue this, uh, this line of reflection, um, you, you have this really fascinating moment where you say, you're commenting on, on Bowie's song. You say this song is about a sun machine, but it also aspires to be the sun machine that it is about. It, you know, it's, it's, it itself is this apocalyptic moment. 
this end of an old world, this coming of a new world. And we hear it in that long, it's not quite a fade out, I suppose, but there's a long section where we hear a repeated refrain. The sun machine is coming down and we're going to have a party. And we hear this several times. And as Derry Bowie sings this, he becomes like Shakespeare, as John Keats calls him, the chameleon poet. He becomes this a chameleonic dis disappearance, as you call it in, 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 in your reality literature. Uh, Bowie, you say, gives us rather differently a disappearing without original. He disappears into the environment of the music. And we hear that voice sinking down into the bed of this music. And we hear this cyclical movement. The sun machine is coming down and we're going to have a party. The sun machine is coming down and we're going to have a party. It's going to happen. But at the same time, not only in the future, it's happening in the song itself. In the song itself, as David Bowie becomes other, loses himself in, in the instruments. This is, as you say, um, is becoming on the run. It is otherness in flight. So the song, in that sense, is about a sun machine. It aspires to be the sun machine that it is about. Another point in your work, you refer to the importance of the voice. When the sun machine comes, it's through the voice. It's about tone and rhythm being born away in the voice or the voices of others. A sun machine, you write, is made of words and the sounds of words. A mad song, as Yeats may say. So this is my preamble to my question, which was supposed to be uh, more, <laughs> more, more quick in coming. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is about this, this importance in your work that you give to music and to rhythm. And that this music and rhythm will not just prophecy or recall the sun machine, but will be the sun machine. And can I just quote you something I think you allude to in the um, in in your work, which is a from a letter Virginia Woolf wrote to uh, to Sackville West, her friend in 1926. And this is the quotation: "Style is all rhythm. Once you get that, you can't use the wrong words. But on the other hand, here I am sitting after half the morning." crammed with ideas and visions and can't dislodge them for the lack of the right rhythm. Now this is very profound what rhythm is and goes far deeper than words. A slight, an emotion creates this wave in the mind long before it makes words to fit it. And in writing, one has to recapture this and set this working, which has nothing apparently to do with words. And then, as it breaks and tumbles in the mind, it makes words to fit it. Such a beautiful reflection. So with this in mind, I want to ask you um, how you think about the relationship between the sun machine, rhythm, music, words. Thank, thank you very much, Lars. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's not a simple question, is it? Um, and and in a sense, I, I suppose my short answer would be um, <laughs> the book. I mean, the book is trying to answer precisely that question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I... I think uh, we're just just in the last few days seeing the publication of um, Laura Marcus's book, uh, Rhythmical Subjects. Um, and uh, alas, Laura is no longer with us, but her book has uh, has been edited by friends and has has. Um, just come out and um i i would suppose that that will be a a foundational text for thinking about these questions um laura marcus was uh deeply um attuned to virginia wolf uh in all kinds of ways um not least in in relation to that quotation that you you read out the the letter to Sackville West and this uh, evocation of, of rhythm as being something which uh, 
in a sense, this is a, an, another way perhaps of thinking about Michael's question, you know, where does it start? You know, it starts with a rhythm that precedes you. And um, it's finding yourself um, gathered into that rhythm or, or um, immersed in that rhythm or in the quicksand of that rhythm, uh, then, then the book's underway. Um, and as you suggest, it is um, very much a, a kind of exposure to otherness. And this, again, is one of the things that I think Blyton and Bowie in their very different singular ways had in common. Uh, so what for Blyton was called the undermined, you know, the idea that she didn't, she didn't know what she was going to write. She just got her typewriter out on her lap at 8.30 in the morning and she went down into the undermined and started typing and, and these characters would, would start talking and the story would start emerging. Um, I think I think Bowie too is you know deeply constantly interested in this sense of openness to otherness, you know, and and the the whole um, you know all all of the talk about the chameleon and and all of the extraterrestrial and 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 so forth is 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 part of that sort of um, deep. Uh, constant uh, commitment to to some sort of uh, affirmation of of alterity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I I loved uh, what you said, Lars. I mean, I, I I I really appreciated the way in which your own prose was seeking to um, bring out something messianic in in the Bowie song and I hope also in the book um the the song itself as uh, as as you doubtless know and as anybody reading the book will discover had this very sort of peculiar provenance in the sense that the the concert on uh the 16th of August 1969 uh, in Beckenham was, uh, it took place just four or five days after his father's funeral. So the the father, his father, whom he, he loved deeply, his father had, had died just 10 days or so earlier. Uh, and According to his girlfriend at, at the time, Mary Finnegan, uh, Bowie was in a you know a foul mood throughout the weekend uh, and made everybody's life hell. Um, at the same time, you know that that weekend, you know while Woodstock, I believe, is still embroiled in lit litigation about the the costs. Uh, Bowie and, and uh, Mary Finnegan made 225 quid uh, from this festival, um, from selling records and um, food and so forth. But he himself, that, that weekend from, from the accounts that I've read, was nothing like uh, the kind of ecstatic uh, figure that one might suppose from hearing the song. So the song is very mysterious. The song was written about a month later. And um, it is, to my mind, it's clearly a, a song about the death of his father. Uh, it, it couldn't not be. But it's about many other things as well. And I think it's very, um, it's very much about this um, aspiration for uh, music to be messianic to be uh, in some way apocalyptic i mean i i i try not to use the word apocalypse uh partly because i wrote my phd on apocalypse uh and so apocalypse has been with me for you know 40 years or m more and uh, you know i if i can stay away from apocalypse i the word then i will <laughs> um I'll, I'll also avoid uncanny if I can, but uh, these things do 
do come out. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Nate. If I if I if I have enough time to ask another question, if you this can question... make it uh, fairly fairly quick, uh, Lars. Okay, so in that pressing, case, but... it'll be another long one. So I'll pass on to the next person. Well, if you want to mention what the question is, we could maybe come back. And... <laughs> sure. I want to ask what it means to write. Um, I mean, you you mention that it was reading rereading the famous five books. It was this was the spur. Uh, this was the thing which opened this realization that a book can be what you call a sound machine. It was reading these books, reading them to your children, reading them after a gap of 50 years. This was the inciting moment which made you realize this crucial idea of the sound machine. And the sound machine as a notion, as an idea um, in, in your work, um, in this particular book, is something which, um, whenever you mention it, you, you, it seems to change, to reconfigure, to... Um, I don't know, shift, turn the kaleidoscope when it, when it comes to all those notions for which your work is well known, telepathy, the uncanny, and uh, this notion of, of the sun machine. I want you to ask, if I had time to ask this, the question I would have asked, what does it add? What does it do? Um, how is the kaleidoscope shifted with respect to those other notions that you've worked with all these years? And indeed, as we found out, um, with this notion of apocalypse, which, which I, I didn't know you, you worked on right at the beginning of your career. So I wanted to know about, the, about this, um, what happens when you read Famous Five and the sun machine um, becomes a possibility for you, not me to think about, but to actually write and make a sun machine. Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, the short answer is I'm still finding out. You know, I mean, I think the I can't write the next book without the thought of a sun machine. Um, but uh, the sun machine as a as a concept, as a figure, you know, I've been interested in the sun for a long time. And, you know, my my PhD was on Wallace Stevens and Apocalypse. And, you know, one of the one of the great apocalyptic poems in Stevens is Page from a Tale from 1948, which is a, um, I mean, critics often construe it as a kind of atomic holocaust poem, but actually it's it's more like a sun, uh, a sun explosion than, um, than something man-made. It's a very strange poem that has a, a, a very, um eerie and in some ways violent relationship with wb yates who who is another uh sun machine thinker for me who who really you know I, I didn't expect to to focus as much as i did in in the book on yates but um in the process of writing yates became you know really quite uh pivotal for thinking about that figure of the sun machine through you know Bowie taking it from Ray Bradbury, Ray Bradbury taking it from from early Yates. Um, so yeah, I mean I, I don't know if that if that uh, is some kind of answer, but thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Alyssa, will you follow? Yes, I will, and I actually want to <clears throat> preface my own remarks by picking up on where we've just been and say to Lars that for me, uh, I heard Nick beginning the book, the first word of the book is when, and the first section is uh, the end times. And I took this as a joke because Nick is stopping short of the end times. So if apocalypse would be the end times, we're, we're one letter before that, we're in the end times. And likewise, um, and so which is metamorphosis, and, and I'm going to pick up on metaphors, metamorphosis in a minute. And likewise, with the sun machine, which is all the things that we've been saying, and Nick pointed out just now that the sun machine is also an S-O-N machine. But then it turns out, so the sun machine, because it's about the father, the dead father, but it also really isn't because the sun machine turns into moon dust will cover you. The sun machine is also a moon age daydream. And the sun machine also is what leads us back to the grandmother. And so, and we'll get to that, which is an alternative, the what, what Nick will call the teethy implex rather than the Oedipus complex. 
Um, and so it seems to me like, I mean, really where, where, where I'm going to get to in a second is, is to childhood and to the queer kinship of childhood that I alluded to um, at the beginning. But before I got there, Nick, I was interested in what you were just saying about, about Bowie not have Americanized, but of course, the way he did that was to ironically figure his relationship to America by writing a whole album, Young Americans. You know, he pulled in behind the fridge and laid her down. Gee, my life's a funny thing. Am I still too young? You know, all night we were the young Americans. So there's that relation too to American backup singers, particularly African American backup singers. And um, the way not to Americanize is to go to the, you know, drive in Saturday. So it's it's an it's it's a resistance to Americanization that nonetheless situates itself you know, in, 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 in America. Um, but now I'm going to switch gears and just um, talk about a moment or a set of, a set of sort of figures and themes that, that I loved in this book. And um, one of them is an image that Nick picks up in the book, which is from um, Walter de la Mer. And we might even say Walter de la Grand Mer. Walter the um and the the quote is children are butterflies he said but many of them by a curious inversion of the processes of nature become half comatose and purblind chrysalids and then he adds I'm driven by a concern with what Len Sixu calls the forever child and this figure um of kind of a reverse metamorphosis right that that we are that we are born butterflies but that what leaving childhood is turns us into this petrified chrysalis and stops us from, from our butterfly self. And um, here I'm gonna go a little bit autobiographical because Nick and I had talked about this because Nick talks in the book about the, the 1976 concert of Bowie that he saw in England and three months earlier, I was in Madison Square Garden and saw the, the same playlist and, um, you know, Nick and I have talked about this. Bowie was a huge part of my adolescence. And um, I, I, I made it through high school by playing a side of Bowie before uh, um, Homeroom. And, um, and so what happened to me in, in, in when Bowie died is I became inconsolable. I mean, my partner can testify. I was howling howling and something was unleashed and touched in me by this death that I I think I experienced more raw grief from this death um, than I have I experienced more grief than I have even even from my parental grief I mean something something huge and I discovered I wasn't alone so I I went around and and discovered that other people were grieving as kind of powerfully. And I made a whole new set of friends. I told Nick I, at Atlanta, they had a parade of people. It was a call out on social media. And, and we played Bowie and we danced our way down the belt line in Atlanta to Piedmont Park. And I started thinking about this because um, I, I was thinking about the, the bond that started to happen. And, and, and Nick, I was reading one of the reviews of your book, the one from Shiny Books, and where Annabelle writes, the first thing she says is, you had me at Bowie. <laughs> you had me at David Bowie. And, and this sense of that, even just by uttering the name David Bowie, suddenly um, these memories, like what Michael was talking about, associations from child. And I started thinking about what, what it, like, Enid Blyton was queer in every way. And the queerness of Eden, Enid Blyton is in her books. And it's also the queerness of, of childhoodness itself. And, and I was thinking that, well, it takes a queer kinfolk to really be able to speak to the child in us. Somebody has to be, has to be queer enough to be able to hit that voice, a voice that's addressed to a child or adjust to that butterfly that hasn't yet been chrysalized. 
And I started thinking about what the experience of children's books are. And um, I have three associations for, for the wound that is a children's book, as if a children's book is, um, is a collective undermined that allows us to form kinship with other children. And, and there's something about reading a children's book where you're not just reading it yourself, you're reading it kind of with all the other children who are reading it. And this made me think, I have, I have three kind of associations here um, to other women, other thinkers of the memoirish, as it were. And, um, you know, one is, is uh, to Roland Bart and and to Bart's Camera Lucida, which is a very has a lot in common with Nick's book, in the sense that um, in Nick's book, Nick discovers or Nick re refines a um, a drawing by his grandmother of his father when he was a baby, and this is sort of has some of the force of the punctum of the winter garden photograph from Roland Bart of this kind of there he was. And um, one of my favorite passages in the whole book is, um, which I told Nick, is um, where, which, which, which comes from a scene from um, section, um, from, from the seventh lecture, but the clouds. And Nick starts to wonder about the questions one didn't ask. And he suddenly wakes up and thinks back and says, what was my father doing in the Croydon bookshop apart from infecting me with bibliophilia? And what he starts to figure out, and there's a scene which is kind of hilarious because Nick's writing is so funny, um, a, a scene where he goes into the Croydon bookshop, which is not in Croydon, and the man behind the counter whose name is or isn't Alan hands him over and says quietly and intensely, I have something for you wrapped up in a paper. And, you know, there's this sort of free song. Is it a pornographic? I don't know what it is. But what it is, is a book illustrated by Lola Onslow, Nick's grandmother. And the adult Nick writing the book that we are reading is suddenly realizing that his most treasured times he spent with his father every Saturday, going to bookshop after bookshop where he would come back with endless volumes and his father would buy nothing that his father was actually looking for his mother. And that in this image of this baby um, that Lola Onslow is painting, Nick gets to see his father's desire for his mother and his own relation to his father through that internal moment. And so all of this I associated to Bart's Winter Garden photograph and the notion of the punctum. And what Bart says about the punctum is, the punctum is what I add to the photograph, um, but is what is nonetheless already there. And there's something about the quality of these memories and the quality of the recovery of the memories that come out through the kick in the eye uh, or the force of the sun machine that brings them out from the undermine and brings that childhood into and, and, and creates this, this whole different futural present. So um, that was sort of one association about this kinship of uh, childhood. And I have two others. And one is because I work on Baudelaire, I couldn't help but think of, of Baudelaire's short text um, in French, Morale du Joujou, but um, um, in, in English, A Philosophy of Toys, where um, the narrator Baudelaire tries to recall a memory from the mists of childhood, as he said, and where he's brought to a Madame Pankouk, who is this velvet and fur, a bit perverse woman who has a wall full, a room of toys. And what she wants is to give uh, a toy or have a child to a nice little boy so that he would remember her. And Baudelaire, the narrator, starts free associating and wonders about, and I guess I'll read you the, the, the less than perfect translation of this, 
Um, and he says, the narrator wonders, it has often struck me that it would be amusing to know all the nice little boys who have now crossed a good part of life's desert and have for a long time been handling something other than toys and yet whose carefree childhood once upon a time took away a souvenir from Madame Pankouk's treasury. And so there's this sense of a fraternal kinship of this encounter with the first toy, the toy that marks you, the toy that, that, that not only is a memory, but shapes all future memory, that is the navel of the sun machine, as it were. And then finally, a uh, last association is to Freud's um, screen memories, where Freud very poignantly writes, um, it may indeed be questioned whether we have any memories at all from our childhood. Memories relating to our childhood may be all that we possess. Our childhood memories show us our earliest years, not as they were, but as they appeared at the later period when the memories were aroused. And it seems to me, and so I guess these this may be more comments than a question, that, that what Nick has done in this extraordinary sun machine is, 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 to, um, is to produce for us a, a, a shared space, I don't, of an undermine that uh, that arouses in each of us the wound of those memories from childhood. So, um, and that that is something about not just childhood itself, but address, uh, uh, but about books that are that come from the place of the child or that are addressed to the child. And so, Nick, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. I don't know if there's a question in there, but I, I wanted to share those thoughts with you. Thank, thank you very much, Alyssa. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I haven't uh, burst into tears yet uh, at any point in any of the. Um, you know, this is now the third occasion when I've talked about this book, but I have to. I have to say, um, it's it, it's in my mind in a way that no other book has done that to me you know the the writing of a book and then then talking about it and uh in some ways what what you've just evoked is um is in danger of being tear jerking uh, in, in a way that i don't really understand because um of course it's quite it's quite dry and abstract when it's set out in a you know, as a as a kind of uh, account of 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 what's going on, but uh, I think you know what what you say is is very much how I found myself feeling and and thinking as I was writing. Um, it's a very accurate um, evocation and. Uh, you know, loneliness or isolation was, of course, one of the most striking and um, in many ways difficult and mysterious things about the pandemic. And most difficult to talk about, obviously, uh, as, as, uh, as we know, every other is every bit other and every, every experience of this is, is different. But uh, I did, I did find it incredible how the the process of reading light and aloud um, did something. Not I could I could feel what it was doing to my children, uh, and often often it was comical. Often it was they they literally fell around laughing uh, but it was also this sort of startling captivation uh, that that Blyton's prose which you know I mean Blyton's prose is not great you know if we're talking about it in a sort of critical aesthetic uh, terms but its power of captivation was extraordinary and the the captivation was not simply of my children, it was of me 
somewhere I'd completely forgotten. And it was that sort of process of realizing you know, that I really knew these stories because they'd been read to me, but I'd completely suppressed or repressed or filed them away um, without thinking about them for years and years. Um, so it was, it, there, there were there were ways in which uh, I, I experienced it as a, a kind of, I got very, uh, you know, interested a few months ago in, in writing about the idea of water and in some ways this is you know Virginia Woolf again the waves but but also um rivers and streams and fountains and and Clarice Lispector the stream of life and and Ellen Sixu on um the marine instant thinking about how uh uh what what Freud might call the return of the repressed was was being experienced for me like a kind of uh, cataract or a huge body of water that was somehow returning or coming through for the first time, um, if I can put it like that. The the amazing thing about uh, Blyton's own autobiography, if I can just add a word about that um this is something that that i do talk about in the book but if people listening haven't come across enid blyton's autobiography in a sense there's no reason why they should it's not in print and it's um it's quite difficult to get hold of but the story of my life uh enid blyton's autobiography is is an amazing text because it's written for children so she's written an autobiography for children. Uh, and the only moment at which there seems to be any kind of rupture in that surface is where she uses the phrase infantile paralysis. Um, in other words, polio, to refer to uh, the illness of her daughter, one of her daughters. But for me, it was a kind of revelatory moment because I saw just, I suppose, how much uh, Blyton isn't interested in adults. She's not, the, the adult is not an addressee. Hmm. Yeah. Nick, Nick um, Thank, thank you so much for that. Uh, very powerful. I, um, I'm watching the time a little bit, and um, I think that if we are to stay on course, I should pass the screen to Nemanja. Nick, I, I, I fear I interrupted you there. Did you want to add a word, or no? No, that's fine. If Elissa, have I have I given you some satisfaction, or um, you're okay? <laughs> very good. Very good. Okay, I'll pass on to to Nemanja then. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, first of all, I really enjoyed reading your book. Uh, uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't stop reading it. It took me a day and a half uh, to to finish it. And I want to say, your way of writing, you, your way of thinking, this is something that is important to me because it reminds me of uh, my love uh, toward literature. But in my question, and maybe this question is obsolete because I believe I can it can be described as a generational question uh i would go i would like to go into a certain personal experience of bowie because my personal experience of bowie was a little bit different because i was born in 1980s and i remember first encountering david bowie not uh, through music but in 1987 being uh, with my father in the cinema and watching labyrinth so my first encounter with bowie is bowie is the gob goblin king and also, I remember when I grew up a little bit, I was a child without control. I could watch anything that was uh, on a TV. In former Yugoslavia, we had winter and summer cinema. And I remember being late for school because I couldn't stop watching Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, seeing Bowie together with Sakamoto. And what I'm interested in this, Bowie's second life on screen, which was... For me and for my generation, it was uh, so important 
because his presence on screen in various films was so captivating and it actually opened doors for us both to his music and toward the music of other people because Sakamoto and Bovi and Forbidden Colors of Ruichi Sakamoto and for example watching the opening of uh, Tony Scott's Hunger and hearing Bauhaus and Peter Murphy so I'm wondering when you so the question is twofold so when you were writing about David Bowie in your book I'm interested why did you omit this um this facet of Bowie's career uh, why was it what was actually the reason because for me you know it was Bowie's appearance that was so captivating for me. And second thing is a little bit more theoretical and it's related to um, chameleonic disappearance. Because I'm wondering, what do you think? How is his chameleonic disappearance related to his appearance in films? Just to give the example, uh, Fire Walk With Me. Agent Jeffries is there not even four minutes, but what people remember about that film is David Bowie as Agent Jeffries in these four minutes because his presence in movies was so captivating and so tangible. And in these all of these movies, he was always present as David Bowie. Yeah, th thank you very much, Nemanja. Um, that's really, really interesting um, question, which I'm, uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't talk about it in the book, I suppose, because the book is, uh, it comes out of the time it comes out of. And um, I, I completely appreciate, and in some ways, Alyssa's already touched on this, but everybody has their own Bowie and um, so for some people um, they don't have a Bowie at all you know I mean it's definitely the case that there are lots lots and lots of people uh, uh, who are left cold by Bowie and um, I've I've been in email correspondence with some of them over the last uh, month or so um, I mean, the the question of his appearance on stage and in films is something that I've been trying to write about recently, and um, so in some ways it's a it's a very helpful question to hear from you. Um, I'm I'm struck. There's a wonderful piece that Bowie wrote for the Guardian in two thousand and one, where he talks about the kind of historic shift that happened uh, in the late 60s. And he attributes it to um, the break dances of Foucault and Derrida, um, but also to a book which I'd never heard of called The Dice Man by Luke Reinhardt. And I thought, well, I better check this book out. I don't know uh, if, some of you perhaps know it and are already um, quite familiar with it. But th this book, uh, Dice Man, the, the epigraph, or one of the epigraphs to the book is, anybody can be anybody. Uh, and that, that, I think, is very deeply uh, Bowie-esque. I think, I think Bowie... Uh, we, we spoke earlier about the idea of Bowie vanishing. I think Bowie had a, a, a remarkable ability to kind of draw energy into himself. And, uh, you know, m maybe this is sort of, we can we can look at this in relation to his interest in mime or his interest in meditation and um, Buddhism and, and so forth. But uh, the the idea of being kind of anonymous being um, 
sort of sort of unrecognizable uh, that, that, that's something which i i do talk about in the book a bit when i'm uh discussing the photographs uh which actually in in this this session this evening we we haven't got to the photographs but there are the photographs in the book are polaroids taken by the painter uh stephen finer in 1995 i think it is and um one or two of those photographs seem to me to be uh, a bit like mug shots and to to give us a kind of bowie who might be anybody you know and there's definitely an interest in bowie in in that sense of um of anybody being anybody and i think that's also a You know, what comes across so often in, in interviews with Bowie is sense somebody who's playful, ironic, um, but also very reserved, you know, keeping his own counsel. And while he's uh, invariably courteous, uh, you know, th there's also, I think, a strong sense of, you know, I can't give everything away, you know, uh, I can't give everything away is is there in his his body when he's on stage and in film as well as this sort of keeping keeping back with holding uh which i find really compelling um and may maybe one way of thinking about your question 